Okay, next up, please welcome to the stage, Joseph Lafredo, coming to us from the University of Albany, SUNY. The title of his presentation is A Survey of MPD, Micropulse Dial, Differential Absorption, Absorption LiDAR Data. Yep. Joseph uh, participated in the 2022 Undergraduate Leadership Workshop, which is another program I have the pleasure of, um, of getting to uh, run alongside uh, Tim Barnes. Um, he came out for a week um, as part of a cohort of about 20 students, and um, we got to bring him back here this year for a full internship experience based in research. All right. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Is that working? Yeah. All right, cool. Um, yeah, thank you, Jerry. Um, and yes, uh, hi, I'm Joe Lafredo. Um, I got the wonderful opportunity to work with Tammy Weckworth at the Earth Observing Laboratory here at NCAR. Um, our research uh, focused on uh, doing a survey of NPD, which is a micropulse dial differential absorption LIDAR. Um, it's data from different field campaigns. Um, uh, yeah, oh wait, let me make this a little bigger so I can see. There we go. Um, yes, so, um, just to give you some uh, background on how this project came about and the motivations for it, um, over the last 15 to 20 years, there have been several calls um, from the National Research Council um, to have improved um, measurements of the thermodynamic profile of the atmospheric boundary layer. Um, the atmospheric boundary layer being the lowest two to three kilometers of the atmosphere. Um, and there's a number of reasons for why uh, improved thermodynamic profiles would help forecasters, and I'll get into that much later on. Um, but so the MPD was developed by Montana State and the Earth Observing Laboratory, um, and it's a uh, tool that's still in development to today. Uh, um, and um, one of the main benefits, I'm not gonna get too technical into uh, what the MPD actually, how it works, um, but one of the really big benefits to some other existing technologies is that it takes direct measurements, meaning that there's no external calibration required, um, and that's a really big benefit. Um, and on the right side of the screen, uh, the top right, you can see um, on the top, that's the um, MPD, um, and the plot below it is um, a microwave radiometer. Um, and this is measuring water vapor in the atmosphere. Um, and as you can see, the MPD has a really high vertical resolution of water vapor, um, as well as the um, microwave radiometer is a passive remote sensor. Um, and that kind of goes into um, what I was just saying about the need for calibration. Um, and so I have the New York State Mesonet logo up there because um, they use microwave radiometers in their mesonet, and um, one of the big challenges that they have is constantly having to calibrate um, their sensors and them not being very accurate. Um, the MPD is something that might not replace the microwave radiometer, but can be a tool that can greatly um, enhance forecasts, and again, I'll get into more of how it can help forecasting later on. Um, but yeah, so, um, on the bottom of this, you can see um, that this is kind of the plot that I'll be showing for the duration of this um, talk. So I'm going to get you familiar with it. Um, so on the bottom, this is um, uh, water vapor measured by the uh, MPD. You, it goes up to about three to four kilometers, at least um, measuring for the boundary layer. It can go a bit higher than that, but we don't really care about that in most cases. Um, and then on the top is relative backscattering, um, which can go all the way up to 12 kilometers. Um, so yeah, I'll be showing plots that look a lot similar to this, so just kind of get your bearings with that. Um, also, this is 50 days worth of data, and there's no downtime on the MPD. So this is also showcasing the potential for a network of MPDs. Um, and this was from the PECAN field campaign. Um, and you might be wondering what the field campaign is. Um, so it took place in North America, predominantly in uh, Kansas. Um, and on the right side of your screen, you can see that uh, like orangey, yellow, I don't know what color it is, uh, box. That's the domain of the uh, field campaign. 
Uh, I also have uh, pointed out where the MPD actually was located um, and also where a radar was located. Um, so one of the big advantages of having the MPD out on several different field campaigns is um, all the different observational tools that were co-located with the MPD. Um, and so I'll get into some cases where different atmospheric phenomena passed overhead of the MPD to just show how useful it can be. Um, so first off, just to give you a little idea of what a gust front is, there's some sort of convection that occurs that has a downdraft. That downdraft has evaporatively cooled air that rushes out on all sides, um, but more so in the direction of where the uh, like mean wind is in the atmospheric boundary layer. Um, so here we have a case from July, that shouldn't be July 2nd, it should be June 7th. Um, but um, uh, here you can see at around 4.30 UTC, um, a gust front pas passes overhead of the MPD, and that's illustrated on the S-pole radar at the top right. Um, and as it passes overhead, there's an increase in the water vapor imagery, and that's what you would expect as you have evaporatively cool air rushing out ahead of uh, or along that gust front. Um, and additionally, I have um, a wind profiler that was co-located with the MPD, um, and you can see um, an updraft when it passes overhead, as that's what you would expect as there's a mesoscale boundary passing through. Um, and then at the end of that loop, you can start to see um, the gust front actually starts to transition into an atmospheric bore. Um, and um, you might be wondering what an atmospheric bore is. Um, <laughs> So uh, an atmospheric bore um, can uh, originate from a lot of different sources, but for the sake of this talk, um, you can think of it as just some sort of density current like a gust front shooting out from some sort of convection. Um, and that uh, gust front will, um, and its associated updraft, will um, uh, interact with a buoyancy gradient that exists usually in the form of a stable layer. Um, in the atmosphere, and the uh, gust front, which is now turning into a bore, will oscillate along that um, uh, dent, uh, uh, stability gradient, um, and you get something like what we see here from, all my days are messed up, that's so weird. Um, oh no, it's not, July 2nd. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, you can see uh, I have the regular uh, MPD image here on the left, um, and it shows a couple really interesting things. First off, um, an elevated um, moist layer, which is something that uh, we can't really get a lot of profiles for. So this is um, another kind of advantage of having the MPD. Um, but then on the right, I zoom in to this interesting area um, where we can see some sort of oscillation or um, some sort of bouncing around that you can see in the relative backscattering and also in the um, water vapor imagery. Um, and uh, looking at some of our observational tools, first this sounding that was taken from about uh, 6 UTC, which is a bit before um, we actually see that oscillation occur, we can see that we have a stable layer just above the surface, um, which is an inversion. Um, so that's showing you the potential for an atmospheric board to exist. Um, and then on the right side of your the screen, you can see a radar image where um, it starts a little bit um, after the bore has already kind of formed. Um, but uh, as you can see in that radar image, there's no convection visible on the radar, um, which is just even more evidence that this is a bore because bores can travel and propagate for long periods of time far away from where they may have initiated as a gust front. Um, so yeah, this was a pretty cool case. Um, next, I'm going to show you a cold front. All you have to really know about a cold front, cold air advancing, there can be um, upward vertical motion in front of it and downward vertical motion or subsidence um, behind it. Um, so here's a case, June 28th, um, around 18 UTC, a cold front passes overhead of the MPD um, and we see a drying out of the atmospheric boundary layer. Um, and you can see that also uh, at the top of your screen on the wind profiler, again, co-located with the MPD. Um, it's a little bit difficult to see, and it's actually kind of uh, cool that you can't actually just see only a downdraft after it passes, but there's in the, the vertical velocity, which is the middle plot, I should explain that. Um, you can see these uh, red and blue um, kind of streaks up from the ground, and those are associated up and downdrafts. 
um, and we call that um, horizontal convective rules, which are very common during uh, the development of the convective boundary layer. Um, and uh, so normally after a cold front passes through, you would expect just large scale subsidence, um, but because you have daytime heating, you have this turbulence in the boundary layer, um, and uh, it's not very visible on the MPD. Um, that's just because um, the, these horizontal convective rules weren't condensing out into clouds, so it's not visible on the relative backscattering. Um, but you, I'll get into more about what a horizontal convective role is. Um, yeah, so as I kind of just explained, um, you have the development of the convective boundary layer after the sun rises, it heats the earth, um, and the moisture level typically increases, but not always. Um, and uh, you can get this differential heating that occurs that can cause uh, associated up and down drafts um, that can lead to cloud streets um, if it can if it can condense out. Um, and I'm gonna show you uh, two days worth of data um, for this next plot. So I'm also gonna show you uh, a mesoscale convective system or an MCS passing overhead of the MPD. Um, what you have to know for an MCS is just that it's a complex of thunderstorms that can propagate for long periods of time. They can shoot out gust fronts. Um, and yeah, let's take a look at it. Um, so yeah, this is a really um, awesome plot, I think, because it shows off so many different things that the MPD can actually capture. So firstly, in the first couple hours, we see that from about one and a half kilometers up in the water vapor imagery, um, it's very dry. And uh, I have four soundings here, starting from zero Z and going all the way to six Z. Um, and we can see uh, an elevated mixed layer um, from about uh, like, 150 kilometer uh, hectopascals, um, and it's already decaying, um, and that's evident because the temperature profile, which is in red, is already not dry adiabatic, and the blue, which is the dew point, is already not so much um, uh, following the mixing ratio. Um, but, and that's evident in the MPD, as around four UTC, we see that the, um, atmospheric boundary layer starting from about one and a half kilometers up starts to moisten up. Um, and then as the day continues to heat up the ground, we see the development of the atmospheric, uh, of the, uh, the convective boundary layer and horizontal convective rolls. Um, unfortunately, there was um, not a great uh, uh, satellite imagery at this time. So all I have is just a radar image of what uh, horizontal convective rules can look like on the radar. Um, but you can also kind of see it um, in the relative backscattering and those little blips that pop up, pop up from about uh, 16 to 22 UTC um, before uh, some convection initiates. Um, and then we see a residual layer um, from about 24 UTC all the way to 30 UTC. That's just that moist layer kind of sticking around overnight. Um, and then around 30, I think, um, 38 UTC, um, there's this kind of um, blank area in the MPD, and that's because there's precipitation and bright clouds. The MPD can't see through that. Um, and that's because there's an MCS passing overhead. And you can see that on the top right, that's a mosaic. So it's not just the S-pole, it's a bunch of different radar sites. Um, and that MCS passes overhead um, and it quickly, decays just right after it passes overhead of the MPD. Um, and so um, you can see that the uh, atmospheric boundary layer dries out really fast before it, it tries to um, kind of rejuvenate itself uh, and moisten back up, but it doesn't have a lot of time. And also there's not a lot of sunlight because there's broken clouds. Um, and so, uh, like I said earlier, the MPD is still in development. So this is from Relapago. Um, which was another field campaign that took place in Argentina in 2018. Um, and at the very lowest part of the uh, water vapor imagery, you can see these spikes of high water vapor and then low water vapor. And that's actually because the air conditioner inside of the MPD was turning on and causing condensation on all the sensors. Um, and so they had never tested the MPD in a really moist environment like Argentina. Um, so this was a good learning experience for them. They since have fixed that issue. Um, and also you can see that the boundary layer really drastically dries out. Um, and I tried looking at some uh, observations to kind of see what was causing that. 
Um, uh, I came up with that it's probably some sort of downsloping because uh, the MPD was right next to the Sierra de Cor Cordoba. Um, so that's a likely um, explanation for it, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, and yeah, just some conclusions. Uh, the MPD is able to measure water vapor at a really high vertical resolution, capturing different atmospheric phenomena, um, and also uh, on uh, water vapor imagery and relative backscattering, and this can greatly help um, scientists and forecasters better understand the moisture in the boundary layer, because we still are still uh, learning a lot about moisture in the boundary layer to this very day. Um, there's been a lot of um, research done with the MPD, like data assimilation into numerical weather models um, to enhance uh, forecasting and uh, predictability of uh, areas where there's extreme rainfall, and it's been shown to increase accuracy of numerical weather models. Um, and in the future, I hope to um, not only continue working with TAMI and potentially um, find more examples and uh, submit them for a uh, BAMS manuscript, but also just continuing working with the MPD as it continues to develop and they uh, implement temperature profiling and uh, calibrated backscattering into the MPD. And yeah, thank you. Any questions? Do we have any questions from the audience? Daniel? I didn't. Hi, Joe. Uh, Hi. Great talk. Um, Hi. So I know you just mentioned the the spikes as a result of the air conditioning. Yeah. So what were those solutions that they were yeah, able to take into account? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so uh, I actually got to go see one of the MPDs at EOL. Um, and <laughs> it's actually kind of funny what the solutions that they came up with. Um, so one of the problems was there's a glass a window on the top of the MPD to allow for the radar or the LIDAR beam to shoot through. Um, and so that was condensing up. Um, and so what they did was they actually started blowing like 75 degree air constantly on just that glass to stop it from condensing up. It, it uh, takes a lot of creativity um, to kind of solve some of these issues. So that was really, really cool. Um, and yeah, yeah, it was really cool learning about it too and just getting to go and see. That was one of the first images that I had here on the left. This is the MPD and the, uh, the glass is right there. And they're actually, that's the little box that's blowing 75 degree air just constantly onto that glass. Um, so yeah, that was really cool. Thanks for the question. Any other questions? Also, Tammy's amazing. I don't know if I said that, but I love Tammy. She's in Norway. I'm very jealous of that. Hey, Joe. Hello. Great, great, great talk. Very interesting. And you already kind of said that you came from, I mean, with some background into this topic, but I'm curious if this experience has shifted your research interests, like broadened your horizons in any way. Yeah. That's a really great question. I'm, I'm actually really glad that you brought that up. Um, so when I was trying to decide on a mentor to have for this internship, um, my area of um, research that I've done and my area of interest is in synoptic meteorology and just large scale dynamics. Um, so doing something that's really small scale, almost micro scale meteorology and working with an instrumentation, um, that was something that I'd never done before. Um, but I had talked to Tammy and she was just amazing. And I thought that, you know, it'd be great to get outside of my comfort zone and work with, you know, an amazing scientist like her. Um, so yeah, I, I think um, having done this project, um, I definitely have a greater appreciation for um, mesoscale meteorology um, and just working with instrumentation in general. Uh, like as I explained with how they solved an issue with uh, the condensation forming on the glass is just also cool. Um, so yeah, and I, I plan to continue working with Tammy after this internship is done. So yeah, it's definitely changed kind of my interest areas. Yeah, thank you for the question. Any more questions? Also, thanks to Ben and Jerry. Oh, question. You guys are awesome as well. 
I didn't give you guys a shout out. I didn't think I'd have time. Uh, this might be a very, first of all, good job. Uh, second of all, this might be a very easy question to answer, but you mentioned at the beginning that the height can be higher, but you don't care or you just ignore it. Yeah. What allows you to just ignore those data points or why do you just yeah, that's, write them so, uh Yeah, that's a good question. Um, that was kind of just me. Uh, yeah, so uh, we, we don't actually ignore it or anything, um, but typically uh, the MPD can't really see higher than um, you know, a couple kilometers, and that's mainly because the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere quickly drops off as you go up in height. Um, so really, you're just getting a, a profile of the thermodynamic uh, atmospheric boundary layer as high as you can. Um, but like, for instance, anything above three kilometers is really, really low in terms of its magnitude. Um, so it's, you don't really gain much information at all from it. So you're not really ignoring it, but yeah, that was just me. Sorry. <laughs> great, great talk. Uh, thanks. thanks. I was wondering, uh, so the air conditioning, does the instrument itself need air conditioning or yes. is it? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. They need to be able to regulate the temperature inside. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. Um, but again, one of the main reasons um, was to <laughs> it was to prevent problems like what happened. Um, but having tested it in an environment like Boulder, where it was predominantly tested, um, or like Kansas, uh, they didn't uh, get to be in an environment like Argentina, which is a lot moister. So yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Fantastic work, Thanks. Joe. Thank you so much.